Welcome to Dr. Bethune's Philosophy of Equity panel discussion. Please welcome our moderator, Dr. Reed Tuxen, the Managing Director of Tuxen Health Connections, LLC. Well, thank you so very much. And it is a great honor to be associated uh, with NCNW and also one of my sheroes, uh, Dr. Cole. This is really, really a, a, a joy for me. And let's remember, as we think about this issue of equity, what uh, Dr. Bethune's philosophy was on equity. And she says, I leave you love. Love builds. It is positive and it is helpful. It is more beneficial than hate. Our aim must be to create a world of fellowship and justice where no man's skin, color, or religion is held against him. Love thy neighbor is a precept which could transform the world if it were universally practiced. Loving your neighbor means being interracial, interreligious, and international. I can't think of a better way to approach this issue of equity because what this conversation is ultimately about is a conversation of whether or not we shall live or whether we shall prematurely die and the quality of that survival. That has to arise out of an ethic of love, of being involved in things that have meaning for life. What we are here to discuss today are things that have meaning for life. It has to do with respect for one's own life and that of others, to resist doing things that have no meaning for life. This is a conversation of celebration but it is also a conversation of concern. This is a conversation that hopefully will motivate us not only to develop our, and renew our own sense of our place in the world and our role in doing things that have meaningful life, but it also means that we have to have fully in front of us the things that are frustrating for life, the things that limit life, that limit life's potential and life's longevity. And this ought to cause us not only outrage, but outrage that is mobilized into loving action. It always has to be about action. And I know that that's what NCNW is all about, is action. To begin our conversation today, we have a special message from a very special person. Dr. Marcella Nunez Smith is a well-renowned epidemiologist uh, her career was as a leader in health equity at, uh, at, at the Yale School of Medicine, who President Biden and Vice President Harris tapped uh, to be their co-leads for their uh, COVID-19 vaccine task force. She has now been named to be in charge of the White House effort on equity and their task force on equity. Imagine this a president of the United States and a vice president of the United States having a special task force at the level of the White House on equity. Thank God for our most recent election. Let's hear from Dr. Marcella Nunez Smith. For me, it all comes down to opportunity. You know, health equity comes about when everyone has a fair shot at living healthy lives and really just achieving their full potential. You know, health equity is not static, it's dynamic. And it happens when our social and economic realities themselves are more equitable. And uh, you know, to the team that's working so hard behind the scenes, if this is- Who has uh, nutrition security, who has housing stability. You know, when everybody has pathways to both educational and economic promise and potential. Really pleased to be here in conversation with you today talking about some of these specifics when it comes to what the Biden-Harris administration is doing to center equity, you know, in the pandemic response, but also looking ahead, right, to resilience in our recovery. Um, you know, so specific to your, your question, in the near term, we uh, have- Kayla to Allen, you might be able to help us uh, on the panel. The equitable distribution of the COVID-19 resources that people need to be safe, you know, to stay protected, to keep their families protected, you know, such as uh, PPE, you know, masks remain essential. Uh, we're making sure um, uh, people have access to those, as well as to testing, you know, when you need it, supports to be able to quarantine or isolate, but also to therapies, which I don't think we, we talk much about, but is at the core for COVID response. 
you know, and of course, uh, vaccinations, you know, like, and let me just maybe spend a moment talking about vaccinations. I know that is top of mind for so many people. Um, you know, our country is definitely at a hopeful moment. I think, you know, we're looking ahead to increase vaccine supply. That's just at the core, quite frankly, of getting the pandemic under control. Um, and I want to make sure people know, like in the first three weeks, the Biden-Harris administration launched four direct federal vaccine allocation programs. So this is about getting vaccine out and into communities, even above and beyond the supplies that are going to, to states and local jurisdictions. So those programs include a partnership with community health centers, you know, partnerships with retail pharmacies, including independent and local pharmacies, you know, community vaccination centers. So some of those are mass vaccinations, but, but not all. Some of those are going to be smaller, like in school gyms. Um, and then, of course, mobile, because we know sometimes we're going to have to bring the vaccine to people. And each one of those federal programs are really being executed to make sure we get to the folks that have been hardest hit um, and highest risk. You know, and all of this is, is data driven. We're working to make sure those resources get targeted using metrics of social vulnerability and other things. You know, and critical, and I think, you know, given our conversation today, the need to work just so closely with community-based organizations, faith-based organizations, advocacy organizations, that's how we're going to be effective in connecting with their clients and their, and their members. Um, about kind of what personally motivates me, you know, I've wanted to be a, a, a doctor since I, since I was a child, since I was six years old. Um, and I grew up in, in the U.S. Virgin Islands, one of our country's territories, and you know, people in my own family, people in my community were just dying too young from preventable conditions. I mean, it came right to my own doorstep with my father having his first major stroke when he was in his, his 40s. Um, and I think then is when I began to just form an understanding that health wasn't just about human biology. You know, and then fast forward um, in my own medical training, as I went through medical school, residency, I saw just countless, countless patients and, you know, their lives, the reasons they were in the hospital were shaped by factors just having little to do with science, quite frankly, and everything to do with broader social inequity. Um, so, you know, we need to think of, of healthcare specifically as encompassing these social and structural realities. Um, and we need to recognize the power of the patient and community voice there. I mean, these these folks know that, you know, they are experts in their own health and their experiences and what's needed. We have generational knowledge that we could be leveraging to achieve health equity. And so that motivates me every day. You know, the community health centers, the federally qualified health centers, they serve more than 30 million patients each year. You know, that's one in 11 people across the country. Um, and, you know, who are they serving? They're, they're serving often you know neighborhoods of color just where people are struggling oftentimes to make basic ends meet um, you know community health centers are anchors in their community we know they are you know often the only and primary and trusted source of care um, for communities that are otherwise often underserved you know low resourced and and even you know even forgotten um, and so it just, it just made sense. You know, I've practiced in a community health center and it, it made sense in our strategic planning work. We just wanted to make sure in the federal uh, COVID-19 strategy that we were building in the support necessary to get community health centers, um, you know, and, and those retail stores, the, the resources they need to launch the vaccination program. Yeah, Black women have such an important role to play uh, moving forward. You know, as we talk about about vaccine confidence, you know, really, I think kind of, I've talked some already about access, which I think is at the core. We have to make vaccination easy for people and convenient, you know, vaccinations are free. We have to make sure people know that. And we have to take all the steps necessary to address structural barriers like transportation, making sure people have, you know, paid uh, sick leave if they need it to get their vaccine. So all of that is, is necessary, but, you know, but at the end of the day, it may not be sufficient. Um, there is for good reason uh, that, that many folks in communities of color in particular and others, you know, might have well-earned distrust of the healthcare system, you know, even of the federal government. Uh, and the reality is that distrust 
at the end of the day often compounds the tendency for these same communities just to get less than their fair share, right? When we're talking about health resources, like we are today with the vaccine. You know, um, I'm, I'm concerned about the signals and the data that we have. Uh, we have race ethnicity data on a little more than half of all vaccinations. So we, we need to do better and asking everybody to help raise awareness that people need to fill out that, that data field for us so, so we know where we are. But even in the data we have, like a clear, clear pattern has emerged. And, and people of color, you know, Black Americans are getting vaccinated at rates below their representation in the general uh, population. And it's so urgent, given the fact that, that these same communities have been so disproportionately affected by COVID, um, that we make sure that folks get, get vaccinated. You know, at the end of the day, uh, folks who have questions about safety and efficacy and the, the vaccines that are authorized, you know, they are safe, they are effective. I've been vaccinated. My mom has been vaccinated. I push everyone who's eligible, you know, to say yes. Um, but that doesn't mean people can't have questions and they should, and we need to answer them. And so, you know, NCNW, you all are trusted leaders and this is where people will go. They will come to you with their questions. And we want to make sure that, you know, all of you have the information you need so you can answer, you know, the conversations that come your way from your neighbors, um, from your family. And at the end of the day, you know, this is my ask to you today. Like, we need your voices in your communities. You are that trusted source of information. You are trusted leaders. Um, we're going to work together. We got to build a consensus of confidence uh, in the safety and efficacy of these vaccines so we can get to the other side of this pandemic. Terrific. I am so glad we got to he hear from this very excellent uh, Black woman scientist and, and now public leader. Uh, I, she touched on three themes that are going to be the focus of our conversation today. Number one, the role of science and the importance of having an embrace of science as we try to close disparities. Uh, number two, she talked about the importance of a, a holistic community-based focus, uh, partnering uh, with the clinical care delivery so that we can try to uh, decrease the disparities in health outcome. And number three, she focused on some of the specifics of African-Americans uh, experience and solutions uh, with COVID. And so we will be drilling into all three of those in our conversation today. Uh, but let me now turn to another video uh, presentation from Dr. Kismikia Corbett. Uh, Kismikia Corbett has become really a star uh, in our community. This young African-American viral immunologist at the Vaccine Research Center at the National Institutes of Health. Um, she is um, in the laboratory of Dr. Tony Fauci, where she is the scientific lead of the Vaccine Research Center's coronavirus team. She is one of the people that is responsible for the uh, availability of the Moderna vaccine. She is clearly a, a, a young scientist of great uh, promise, and we will be, I'm sure, hearing from her uh, long into the future. But for now, we get to hear her on this program. Hello, everyone. And it is so nice to come to you today virtually at the 85th Annual Symposium of the National Council of Negro Women. I am Kismikia Corbett, and I am the scientific lead of the coronavirus vaccine team at the National Institutes of Health in the Vaccine Research Center, where I and my team for the last six years have studied coronavirus vaccine development, and our work has led to the development of a SARS-CoV-2 vaccine for the COVID-19 pandemic in collaboration with Moderna. I come to you firstly today as a black woman and secondly today as a scientist to inform you a little bit about the safety and efficacy of the vaccines that are currently approved for emergency use through the Federal Drug Administration. The vaccines that we developed in collaboration with Moderna and the other vaccine that is currently available as it is developed by Pfizer are messenger RNA vaccines. It is understandable that Hearing this term, knowing that it is a novel or new type of vaccine does create some level of hesitancy, particularly in Black Americans. But I am here to ensure you that number one, 
all of the data and the science points to these vaccines being safe and effective. And number two, that the work that we've done over several years, whether it be in our team or other teams all over the globe, have ensured that the rapid development of these vaccines is safe and effective. Also, aside from all of the data, it is important for us to remember what the end goal is. We, as African Americans in our communities, are oftentimes plagued with health disparities, whether it be from the COVID-19 pandemic or otherwise. Those disparities oftentimes leave us in harm's way when it comes to diseases. In the case of COVID-19, Black Americans are three times more likely to succumb to infection, which is extremely inappropriate and unacceptable. With that, a vaccine is one of the great equalizers of health disparities with equal distribution and of course, equal uptake. It is notable that Black Americans do have a bit more hesitancy than other populations, largely because of a history of medical injustice and otherwise. So I, I understand, I completely get it. I, even being a scientist, having developed the vaccine, had to reiterate to my family even, who was initially hesitant about how important it is to be vaccinated in order to protect yourself but also to protect the community around you. In closing, I would like to say thank you to the organizers for inviting me to this meeting. It is unfortunate that um, due to my schedule, I could not be with you today live, but I hope that this recorded message reaches your spirit and your heart. And if you find so inclined, hopefully when a vaccine comes available to you, that you remain informed around your health decisions so that you can choose whether to get the vaccine or not. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Corbett. And I do think that you have touched our heart, but what you've done also is to provide a living example for all of our young people uh, to know that there is a career in science available to you and that it is an exciting career and this is one of the themes, as I mentioned, that we're going to be talking about today with our panel. And let me just give you an introduction to our three panelists. I am very, very pleased to, to, to have met uh, through this process, Colleen Payne Neighbors. Uh, Colleen Payne Neighbors is a serial entrepreneur who has founded seven successful businesses, one of which is the MCI Diagnostic Center, where she also works as the COO. In partnership with Abbott, she established this company as an early leader in the COVID testing space, and she was deeply involved with the National Task Force of the federal government. She is a really seasoned entrepreneur who knows how to translate entrepreneurship into service to the Black community. A remarkable, remarkable woman as is Dr. Valerie Montgomery Rice, uh, a friend and colleague of mine of long standing, president and dean of the Morehouse School of Medicine. Particularly germane in her background to our conversation today is that she's the founding director of the Center for Women's Health Research at Meharry Medical College, which grew out of her distinguished career as an obstetrician gynecologist who specialized in reproductive endocrinology and infertility. And we're particularly pleased also that Dr. Tony Hoover is with us. Tony Hoover has really developed a very interesting career. She currently is the Director of Strategy, Planning and Management for the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, where she leads a team that is responsible for supporting the programs and functions with business strategy and operations, uh, portfolio and project management, and engagement with industry and product development partners. In her role, she is focused on delivering high impact interventions in global health by integrating the network of diverse partners. Prior to that, she was the Senior Vice President and Site Director at Pfizer Worldwide Research and Development, where she oversaw the operations of the company's largest research and development laboratories. We are really privileged to have these three remarkable women with us. And let me start uh, with, uh, with you, Colleen, and then move to Valerie and then to Tony. Let me ask you this opening question. What does health equity 
mean to you? We, we hear this term of health equity, but, but we translate that into our own uh, ethic, our own philosophy as it guides us in the work that we do. So let's start, Colleen, what does health equity mean to you? So Reed, health equity means to me is what we're seeing currently. Um, uh, our underserved community not having equal opportunity to health, uh, not having equal opportunities uh, because of the places in which we live, uh, our communities not having adequate um, resources to get the medication that we need or resources. And, and specifically in this pandemic, I mean, I have been on the ground since day one being on the task force and I have seen so much disparity and we have 100% tried to deliver to our underserved community. So mostly we are, a, we have a, a, a nation or a population of people that we are distrusting in some fashion of the healthcare system. But at the same time, we definitely need the care and we need to be always included in the conversation. So that disparity of unequal justice should, we have to correct that. Just because of the places in which we live does not devalue the course of our life. Beautiful, beautiful. Valerie Montgomery Rice, what does health equity mean to you? You know, to me, health equity is about giving people what they need, when they need it, and the amount they need to reach their optimal level of health. And I would ask our audience to do something with me. And it's a graphical depiction that all of us have seen. I want you to close your eyes. And I want you to imagine three friends going to the baseball game. You remember Little League. One friend is short, one friend is medium height, and one friend is tall. They're late. They finally get their tickets and there are no more seats and they have to stand behind a fence where the short friend can't see over the fence. The middle height friend, the fence touches him at his nose, right, right below the eyes though. And the tall friend can see over the fence. So the tall friend says, Hey friends, let me go get us some boxes. And at first he comes back with these boxes and he gives everybody one box. The short friend still can't see over the fence. The middle height friend, he can actually see over the fence now. And the tall friend is standing on the box and he's blocking everybody behind him. So the tall friend says, wait a minute. My short friend needs two boxes today. My middle height friend only needs one box and I'm tall enough to already see over. So I don't need a box at all. Now imagine that seeing that game over the fence is health equity, is optimal health for people. Some people in their box need access. Some people need transportation. Some people need a job. Some people need access to the latest therapy for the treatment of diabetes or hypertension. Some people need technical assistance. Imagine if we gave people what they needed in those boxes to see over the fence, look over the fence to see the game. That's what we have to remember that health equity is, giving people what they need, when they need it, and the amount they need to reach their optimal level of health. Now, the last part of this, what happens if we remove the fence? Then we're talking about justice. <laughs> beautiful, just beautiful. Well, Tony, you have a very big box to stand on because you look not only at the United States, but you look at the whole world. And so I'm curious from a big box perspective, how do you see health equity? Oh, thank you, Reed, and it's a pleasure to be on such a distinguished panel today. Um, health equity um, means to me that everyone deserves the chance to live a healthy and productive life. And at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, we take that so seriously that that sentence is stamped on the side of our building. It's the motto by which we live. Um, health equity would mean that there is not a difference between the life expectancy at birth. And um, there was some sobering data that came out just last week from Health and Human um, Services 
Um, the National Center for Health of uh, statistics revealed changes in life expectancy from 2019 to two, uh, 2020 in the US where black men um, had a reduction in their life expectancy of three years. Um, black women, 2.3 um, years relative to 0.8 years for white men and 0.7 um, years for uh, white women. Hispanic men had a drop in their life expectancy by 2.4 years relative, um, as well as for Hispanic women by 1.1 years. The, when you look across various diseases, you see the same disparity. In a life where, in, in a world where everyone deserves the right to a healthy and productive life, you don't see those disparities. You see those disparities eliminated. And that's what health equity means for me. That is a really dramatic way to think about this. Again, what this is all about is whether or not we get to live. This is about whether you live or whether you prematurely die. And what you are saying to us, Tony, is right now the experience of COVID combined with everything else means that we will live three years less than other folk. Three years left. I love life. My life is precious. I love every day. I don't care how challenging it is. But to lose three years of days? Yeah. No, we got to fight back. And one of the ways and that, that was just in one year. That yeah. was just in one year. In fact, it's not even a full year data yet. It's, a, it's actually even a portion of a year. So I hope to God those numbers do not get worse over the last part of this year. But I want you to stay on the mic, uh, uh, Tony, because one of the themes that we're trying to explore today is if we're going to deal with closing the gap with equity, it has to also mean that we embrace new ideas, new innovations, new science. Science should be our friend as we try to give ourselves the best chance for life. And so embracing science and learning to a love of science is very important. I'm wondering how do we start to encourage this more in our children and particularly our young girls? How did it happen for you, Tony? How did you begin to embrace what I now see is a lifetime of learning in science for you? So it started um, from some curiosity. I uh, grew up in New Orleans and I had my share of um, seeing abnormal behavior uh, on the streets of New Orleans as well as in my own family. So I was curious as to what is the underlying reason for um, abnormal behaviors, cognitive deficits, uh, and so I had a, um, a drive to better understand what I finally studied is um, psych experimental psychopathology to understand um, what were at the root of some of the cognitive deficits in such diseases as schizophrenia and Alzheimer's disease. And so I began my journey in science um, as a psychologist, uh, experimental psychopathologist neuro and doing neuropsychological assessments. And I um, became, fell in love with um, conducting studies to better understand the impact of various types of potential new treatments to be able to um, um, help individuals have a better life when they are suffering from various types of mental illnesses. And I came to realize that the research I was doing with the other researchers was wonderful um, at a research center, but I wanted to have be able to have an even bigger impact. And that's when I moved into the pharmaceutical industry um, to be able to um, do conduct research on potential new treatments for Alzheimer's disease, um, uh, major depressive disorders, um, psychiatric, uh, other types of neuropsychiatric disorders uh, uh, on a global scale. And that led me to 
um, be the project leader, the product development leader for what would become the first treatment for um, fibromyalgia and a new treatment um, for neuropathic pain and seizure disorders. And one of the highlights of my life is that that particular product was able to help my cousin who suffered from seizure disorders. And by adding that uh, medicine, it was able to allow him to go seizure free. So the, the, it started with curiosity and then led to um, a desire to want to be able to give back to society utilizing the skills that I had developed over many years, which is why I'm working at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, uh, helping the organization make um, investments in new treatments, new interventions um, for the treatments of such diseases as COVID, um, HIV, AIDS, malaria, tuberculosis, um, various types of, uh, neuro, um, of neglected tropical diseases, as well as uh, maladies that afflict maternal and newborn and child health. Well, I love the, 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 the way you opened that up and the way you ended it. And that is this critical word called curiosity. And one of the things that we heard from, uh, as I turn to Valerie, one of the things that we heard from our previous speakers uh, is the sense that, that we know that there is this distrust of science, but there's a distrust of science, but also we are not embracing science. We don't allow our children to have the, the, the spare moments to dream and be curious and then to be able to have that resources to explore it. Valerie, you have had a very interesting career because I know you even as your college education at Georgia State, I mean, you've had like one of the most intense scientific uh, 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 educations of any black woman in this country. Uh, why did you have that curiosity? How did you see it? And what do you learn from your experience that we can translate over to, to young black women? You know, one of the things that I had was great examples of resilience and grit, starting with my mother, who was a single parent of four girls, and she raised all of us by herself. She worked in a paper factory, 73, 3 to 11, 11 to 7, for 25 years. And my mother did not know about subliminal messaging or any of that. But when she came in off the midnight shift, I was getting ready to go in on the morning shift. She would come to us and she would whisper in our ears, all things are possible. You can be anything. Now we thought it was like a gnat in our ear just getting on our nerves. And so we really thought she'd be crazy. But she was preparing us for the future because what she did not want for us was what she had accomplished. Even though she didn't see it as much, we saw it as the world, but she wanted more. And she messaged that to us. This curiosity and this belief that anything was possible was really what sustained me because I didn't have a lot of advisement coming from uh, high school. I graduated from high school. My graduating class was 1,049, making uh, Southwest Macon was the largest high school in the nation in 1979. I was the only black girl person that was in our science classes. And my teacher said to me, you look like you're really good at math and science and they want more black kids to be an engineer. So why don't you go to Georgia Tech? So got a scholarship, went to Georgia Tech, didn't have any idea what it meant to be a chemical engineer. Started co-oping, got a job offer. And then I got scared because I said, you know what? This is not what makes me happy. So I went to the Encyclopedia Britannica. You remember encyclopedias? Y'all remember those? If you do math, science, and people, medicine comes up. And so I decided I'd go to medical school. Never took a biology course other than high school. But I had been prepared to be a learner. I understood what continuous learning was. And Georgia Tech, to this day, is still the hardest thing I've ever done. 
It taught you grit. It taught you resilience. And like Tony, I was curious. And I really thought that I could do anything. And the rest is history. I went on to Harvard Medical School and a whole bunch of other things. But I am reminded of something that really relates to what Tony said. I had the opportunity to interview Satya Nadella not too long ago at Microsoft. And I asked him a similar question, Reed, to what you just asked us. And he said something to me that has resonated with me. He said, when I was growing up, I had the ability to explore and somehow fall in love with things without actually being good at them. I had no systemic challenge of being able to select things that I wanted to pursue. My passion, I was able to do it based on curiosity, no pre-selection bias. Imagine if all of our kids had that opportunity. Every year I read the book, The Alchemist, every year. Because if you want something and it is right, the universe, the entire universe will conspire with you to make it happen. That was that subliminal messaging that my mother was giving for me. Perfect. It was hope, it was promise. That's what we have to do for our kids. I know we're gonna talk about the lack of black males in medical school and the lack of black scientists. But what I would love to for this organization to understand is the impact that we all have as women and the power that we have as women to change the world. It was a black woman who changed my world. Beautiful. And for those who are not familiar with The Alchemist by Puello Coelho, uh, you ought to pick it up. It is an incredibly wonderful, moving book. And uh, I didn't know we had that in common, Valerie, but, but Puello is one of the great writers in my life. Well, uh, Colleen, um, same question. Um, you have embraced science. You have embraced curiosity. Uh, and I'm particularly curious about how you got started and what lessons we can use as for, for educating and inspiring young black women as we get use science to close the gap in disparities and promote equity. Right. Well, first, powerful stories, ladies, just incredible, the journey. But I think that any African-American woman that is at this level, to get here, you have to go through something and the journey had to be significant. So I too had a very, very significant woman in my life, which was my mother. Uh, I am from Oklahoma. Uh, we, uh, I started MCI Diagnostic Center 24 years ago, and we are now in four states. And my mother was, now the, the term today is, is much different, but my mom was a maid, but today she would be a domestic engineer. And you know, my mother, there's eight of us, and so, a rite of passage in these little country towns, like in New Orleans and that thing, was that you worked with your mom, right? Or you worked in that family. When I got uh, to about 14 years old, my sisters had all done it. We go and we work with our mom. We go and we do, do that domestic and we clean the house, right? When it, when it became my turn, you know, I, I, didn't, I didn't particularly like that. I didn't care for that. But see, I only went about a week with my mom when it was my turn, my rite of passage. And my mom never asked me to go again. And so I never understood why she never asked me to go again. But you know, I would tell you that had she had on her dying bed, I asked my mom one question because the question that I asked her was why not me? Why did you not take me when all my other sisters went and my brothers, some of my brothers went with her? My mom equally said to me, it would have changed the composition of who you were because it didn't make sense. And that was the one question that I'd always wanted to know. So my journey started when I was about maybe 14 years old. I was in school and we all remember those uh, classes, VOE, vocational education, where they learned you how to type and they learned you how to do shorthand and that I'm, you know, I'm of that era. And everybody, all my friends and my sisters, they were all having fun in this class. They'd go on the best field trips and they'd have the best time. 
And that class was right by our lunchroom. So you had to pass by it and the girls would be having so much fun. But see up here, I realized that if I ever walked in that class and took that class, no matter how much fun it would be, I would be stuck at one of the Hertz data centers or one of the centers doing data entry. So, and I realized if I got out of school and I had no skill set to type or to do shorthand, I only had one direction. That was to go to college. So my journey started with me making a decision at 14 years old that I had no decision. And that decision would be not to get out of school with a skill or not even a technical trade. So my only decision in Oklahoma was to go to the University of Oklahoma because I had nothing else. I couldn't type, I couldn't weld, I couldn't do any of the things that they taught us. So when I went to school, I became a nuclear medicine technologist. I am probably one of the only ones in the state of Oklahoma, probably one of very few of us. And I came up with uh, a concept here in Oklahoma being very rural that I made $40,000. And I had an idea that I could put all of this technology in a nuclear medicine department and a radiation department on wheels and travel the state of Oklahoma providing services back then to now what we consider the very underserved. And so I, did, I just knew I could. I didn't know that I couldn't because see, my mom told me that I could. And as my mom sold everything in the back of her car to make sure that I went to school, you know, I learned very on, early on. So I went out and somebody, I had a great idea. I had a nuclear medicine uh, truck that it was custom built out of Chicago. Uh, the biggest bill in my closet was a, a truck payment that I paid for $400 a month. And I bought a million dollar truck when I was about 24 years ago. I drove that truck. I became the engineer. I fixed the truck. I fixed the brakes. I fell out the truck. I got the gas. I did it all. And then I'd jump in a suit at the end of the day and go in and market. You know, I'd go in and tell people smelling like gas. And, and I never honestly told people, you know, all of the stories of that truck. Um, but it was one of the biggest tests that we did. It was a myocardial perfusion scan. And from there, doctors would come to me and ask me, would you, would you come out? So we were running a, a large, very large mobile division here in the state of Oklahoma and some parts of Kansas. And then I started doing mobile ultrasound, mobile nuclear medicine. And then doctors would say, you know, can we send patients to you? And I'm like, why would you send them to me? I'll go to you. Then I put in a... MRI center, a CT center, a nuclear medicine center, a pain management center, uh, ultrasound, surgical center. I had done it all. And then I realized, I don't say that I can do anything better than anyone else. I just had heart and desire because the woman that allowed me to stand, that did not change the chemical composition of me, didn't tell me that I couldn't. And so I did. And so we became one of the largest centers here. But then, you know, the, the time of laboratory testing uh, came up and I realized that I could, I only had limited time on bed space, on surgical space. And I realized with the laboratory, I could reach, I could reach the masses. And so I decided that every year I would add something to this, this place. And about seven or eight years ago, I added laboratory services and uh, put in uh, a very large laboratory. But I like the laboratory because I could reach outside of the state of Oklahoma. 90% of my business came from Texas. And so today we have over $110 million in contracts that we've done. And we have one of the largest contracts with the Department of Labor that we do all of the job core facilities in the nation in all 50 states. And so what I would say to all the young girls because he coming from Oklahoma 50 years ago, I didn't, we didn't know that new term that they use on the West Coast and the East Coast, you know. We didn't know that such term about being having a mentor. That is such a buzzword and it's such a supportive word now that we have to support. Because I think the best statement I ever heard was when you make it to the boardroom, you don't close that door. You put your foot in the door and allow another Black woman to walk through that door and you have done something with your life. So I got all of that from my mother. She never told me that I couldn't. And the one thing that I would say to this day, for all the young women looking at us women out here, you've had to go through something to get here. 
And I always like to tell people why I get to sit and have a conversation. But the most important thing that I would say to any young girl, if I did it on $40,000, anyone can do it. There is no magical pill. It's gut, grit, and determination. And what I would say to any young girl and what I would say to my same self, that same 16-year-old girl that did not walk into that VOE class, that did not take typing, that did not have a direction, I would say to that same 16-year-old girl, you know what? It's going to be okay. So yeah. science, math, and technology, you get the degree that today I never worried about being fired because you know what? I had a degree in nuclear medicine and I was really, really super good at it. And at 57 years old, I still keep that piece of paper active. I'm not for sure why, but I still keep it active. So mm -hmm. I tell all the young ladies, if I did anything that is any part of Remarkable that you think, you got so much more to do beyond me. So. Beautiful. Well stated, all of you. And now, and, and so it was important to lay those things down because if you were going to solve the problems of equity, we're going to have to be thoughtful. We have to be smart. And we have to learn not to be afraid of innovation. Uh, Dr. Kismetti Corbett talked about this mRNA vaccine. Uh, to understand the concept of that requires some education. It requires thinking. It requires being able to sit down and open up a book and, and reading about it and learning about it so that we're not intimidated by innovation as the world moves on around us. And so that becomes key. I want to move us now to the next part of our conversation a little bit, and we're going to probably in, these, in this questioning round keep our answers a little shorter now, and we're going to really kind of focus in now on being succinct on a few ideas. And I want to stay with you, Colleen, for a moment, because we are in this era of the mRNA vaccine. We're in the genomic era. And what we know about genomics and genetics is that the diagnosis and the things that you do in your company these diagnostic reports are going to not just say you have a disease or not have a disease, but you're going to talk about statistical elements, about the probabilities of having a disease or not based on genetic profiles. It's just one of the new ways in which innovation will come into our lives. And so I'm wondering, sort of in your mind, how do you think we're going to handle uh, the interpretation of the next evolution of diagnostic information so that African Americans will be able to make the most personally appropriate health choices for themselves and their families in an era where this is going to be even more complex. You know, one of the, one of the greatest things that I've seen that um, we as African Americans are not entitled to, and we're just not shown, there's a very, very simple test out here that is really revolutionary is pharmalo pharmacogenetic testing. And that test is such a, it, it used to be, a, the, the test is, a, a, to ver be very quick, uh, Angelie Jolie had that test done when she had both breasts removed. We did not know why she did that, but her DNA suggested breast cancer was not only in her future, but it was coming for her again. So there are, there are various tests that we do every single day. That test then was probably maybe thirty or $40,000 for that particular test when she had it done. Today, pharmacogenetic testing, we are, we are plagued with hypertension, diabetes, uh, cancer, all of these very, very simple tests. That test now is down to almost $200. And when you have hypertension as an African-American, my husband is super, super incredibly healthy. Uh, he exercises probably three or four times a day, but he is predispositioned no matter what he does to hypertension. He doesn't like that, but it is a fact. We could never get his blood pressure regulated. And about seven, six years ago, we did a pharmacogenetic test, simple test. It is now probably $200 on my list. It told him exactly genetically what he needed to take. We changed his medication and we put him on the medication that made sense for his body. Voila, blood pressure gone. That is a very, very simple test for anyone with diabetes, hypertension, um, just uh, pains. Uh, we use it a lot in pain management because it matches, the, it'll tell you that this is not a good drug for you, yeah, this I'm drug is good for you. So it's, so it's a lot of different tests out there 
that we don't always get because of the disparities in our community. That's a very simple test. You've been on hypertension medication and you can't control your blood. Ask for a pharmacogenetic test. It Good would change you. your life. Cancer patients, same thing. So Good. Good. very Good. simple test out there to do that. So let's move that, and you've set it up very well for Valerie Montgomery Rice. Dr. Rice, Montgomery Rice, as you think about uh, the role of educating our next generation of health professionals, they're going to have to be able to provide the kinds of guidance and information that Colleen just mentioned around things like the test that Angelie Jolie had. And she, I'm glad that she put that example forward. That was very important and a very useful example. So how do you sort of see, Dr. Montgomery Rice, that we're going to have the ability, first of all, to produce enough of our young uh, uh, health professionals who can come into the field? And, and then how do you sort of make sure that as we educate them, they'll be prepared to explain the kinds of things that Colleen just went through to uh, our community uh, who often often doesn't have the scientific background to fully embrace some of those ideas. So Reed, I will say that one of the things that we clearly are focused on is ensuring that we create a pipeline of prepared persons to go to medical school, to go to get a master's or a PhD in biomedical sciences. And so we, of the four historically black medical schools, you know that we have graduated more black physicians in the last 10 years than the top quote unquote, 10 schools in the US News and World Report have done in the last 15 years. Just the four of us have graduated more. And that is because we are very intentional. So we know that we have a significant underrepresentation of Blacks in, in the field of medicine, representing only 5%, whereas we make up 13 to 14% of the population. So we have a gap there. And if we narrow that down to Black males, only about 600 Black males went to medical school last year out of 22,000. And if you look at U.S. born Black males, it's less than half of those were U.S. born. So we have some opportunities and we are focused on that. Each of the four historically Black medical schools, we have increased our class size over the last five to 10 years, but that's not enough. The other 152 medical schools need to be as intentional uh, as we are in ensuring that we educate and train the healthcare professionals that the world needs. Now, what happens when we get them in the environment? We expose them to the latest and the greatest technology opportunities, and we create a curriculum that's second to none. One of the things that the four historical Black medical schools are developing right now as we speak, a human genomics institute at each of our schools and collaborating to develop a centralized human genomics institute that will be virtual, but that will be re reside on the four at the one at each of our schools. So you can imagine those four spikes, uh, our spokes, and then culminating in this virtual human genomics center. Now, what are we gonna do? We are gonna collect samples from underrepresented minor minorities, such that we can create a genomic database that actually has representation of Blacks and Hispanics and Latinx and Asians and others, which was not used uh, when you develop the current human genome. Okay, so we're going to create a human genome so we can do exactly what Dr. Payne Norris talked about. Make sure that we are using genomics as a way to help to diagnose and to treat disease. We also are going to do a second thing. We understand that genetic counseling is significantly important. So part of our ask as we're building this human genomic center is that we need a genetic counseling program at each of our institutions such that we are educating and training people in a culturally appropriate way of how do I engage patients who are black and brown about genomics and genetics and how does this impact my decisions for not just diagnostic care, but clinical care. And then how do we follow these patients for years from now, such that we can use that information to innovate and develop the next generation of therapies so that we can eliminate, not reduce, but eliminate health disparities, hypertension, diabetes, heart disease, cancers, 
this is what we will utilize genomics in. And it really takes an intentional plan, educated and training the healthcare professionals that the world needs, ensuring that their, their educational experience is second to none and integrating that with innovation and technology such they are prepared to go out and change the world. Before I come to Tony, I want to just follow up one quick thing with you, uh, Valerie, and that is, uh, again, one of the challenges that we are facing in our community with COVID, as you well know, is the sense that uh, we need trusted messengers who can carry the truth to our community. And one of the things that we have learned through the work that I, at least that, that I'm doing as the uh, co-founder of the Black Coalition Against COVID, of which mm -hmm. you, Valerie, are an integral uh, member, is that our community trusts our physicians. And so it is so important that you're doing these things. Could you just take a quick moment also to mention this partnership that you've developed with the largest black hospital uh, system in the country to expand the number of African-American physicians? So Common Spirit Health, which is actually not a black hospital system, but you know it's the largest uh, not-for-profit health system that cares for underserved populations. Uh, in 22 states, 141 uh, health systems uh, and a thousand points of care, CEO is Lloyd Dean. While we were doing some other work An together- African-American male. Yes, Lloyd and I recognized that we had much in common our mission and our vision for achieving health equity at each of our institutions. And so we put our heads together and said, yeah, you could open up a new medical school or we could expand the model that Morehouse School of Medicine has had significant success. We have less than 2% of our students who don't finish medical school or graduate school. Okay, less than 2%. And we recruit students from underserved, underrepresented community, and they're academically diverse. And we shift the curve with them, graduating them at phenomenal rates. So Lord and I came up with this idea that we would open up five regional medical campuses around the country, focused on black and brown people. And we would recruit students from those communities who would come to Morehouse School of Medicine and spend their first two years. And then they'll go back into those communities and do their third and fourth year clinical rotations at those common spirit hospitals. But we didn't stop there. We also said we need graduate medical education training program because we only account for 4% of the people who are in graduate medical education programs. We're gonna open up 10 graduate medical education programs around the country at 10 of their sites with no less than three disciplines at each GME program. Now, what will this mean? In five to seven years, you will see Morehouse School of Medicine be a class size of 225 medical students coming in. And you will see them, about 100 will stay here, but another 125 will go out to these regional campuses. But what will they have in common? They will have the touch of the culturally appropriate education and training that we are known for here at Morehouse School of Medicine, because we're going to educate and train the healthcare professionals that the nation needs. So what I hope is everybody in the audience, as you start thinking about this opportunity to embrace closing disparities by having not only access to new technology, but having access to training for more African-American health professionals, there is a reason for you to whisper in your child's ear at night before they go to sleep. Nothing can stop you. You can do it. There are spaces open at all of our four historically black colleges uh, for medical school, and they're there for, for you. Now, Tony, you have a, another view on this, I think, because again, I come back to your experience at Gates where you're looking at the world and you're involved in many other countries and you're seeing uh, these issues through a world prism. And so I sort of wonder again, how do you sort of view the issues that we're talking about now from that perspective? Well, Reed, it's quite interesting. Um, I was uh, writing notes while both Colleen and Valerie were commenting because there's so many similarities. Um, Colleen was uh, talking about the mobile ultrasound units that um, her, uh, her company has. Uh, because of the low resource settings that the Gates Foundation works in, 
uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa, Southeast Asia, we're investing in innovations that are coming from those local, um, those local and regional innovators, um, such as a handheld um, ultrasound that is connected to a smartphone that is used by a, a trained community health worker who can send that, um, that digital picture to a trained professional, radiologist or OBGYN. So that's one, um, just one of a multitude of technologies that are emerging to be utilized in low resource settings that I can see also being utilized in the United States and other high income countries that have pockets of, uh, of people who have been marginalized in vulnerable communities. I want to also go to, um, what um, Valerie talked about, the Human Genomics Center. I'm so pleased to hear about that, Valerie. And because the similarities in um, Sub-Saharan Africa, where we've, the Gates Foundation has helped to invest in something very similar for the similar reasons that there was a lack of knowledge, availability of data on, uh, the African continent around the genomic sequencing. And so that is being done. It's led by uh, a South African black scientist who is an up and coming innovator who is taking that um, genomic sequencing data and then going back into a um, laboratory in a discovery research effort to develop new treatments that are derived from African data, from data that comes out of the genomic sequencing and from uh, laboratories that are run by Africans. So there are quite a few similarities in what both Colleen and Valerie discussed that are applicable at a global level. Beautiful. I really like that. And so uh, one Please, of the can things- I I, one thing on what, Can I say one yeah. thing on what, what Tony's saying? Because I want what this audience to know. As we are so involved right now with COVID-19, so we are at each of the four historically Black medical schools, we are all doing COVID-19 vaccine trials. And within the next two weeks, we will start sequencing all of the COVID-19 positive that we get in our environment where we are doing regular testing. And it was a partnership between Thermo Fisher uh, and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation called the Just Project, where we are now being able to, at the four historical Black medical schools on a couple of the spoke schools undergraduate, where we are actually able to provide COVID testing for all 105 HBCU undergraduate schools. And we've added another project to this where we're going to start to sequence the specimens that turn positive so that we can add to the data of the variants based on the environmental influences. So this is real time work that is happening. This will be important for our public health students. This will be important for our medical students, our biomedical science students. They are getting to participate in real time science and understand how the dots connect and they make a difference. And I know that uh, at some point uh, after this meeting is over, you and Colleen will have a chance to chat about opportunities for her to participate in this as well. I, um, sure. As we start to move this uh, conversation, I wanna just really nail this issue though. Um, you know, Dr. Uh, Janetta Cole is again, such a role model for all of us, whether you're mm -hmm. women or black men uh, and, and her attentiveness to the education of our people to prepare us to live in the modern world. And so I think it is very important, given all that you three women have said, that our audience remembers to be strong advocates for science and math in our local schools. This mm -hmm. is vital. If we're going to close the gap and have health equity for all the reasons that we have now so laid out and you three have laid it out so clearly in our conversation so far, we have got to fight for 
science and math education in our junior and senior high schools. And I know that the NCNW will make sure that we kind of do that. And by the way, the reason that I uh, needed to be corrected about spirit health being not a, a, an African-American hospital system was though, is it a very important issue. The two leaders that brought together uh, that entity were two uh, African-American men who are running two different health systems. That's and right. it is amazing to me when we think about the fact that mm -hmm. this gigantic hospital system could be created uh, by the merger and the vision of two black men coming That's together right. as brothers and as partners to do serious business and then having them partner with Valerie uh, to do what she does. This is really, really extraordinary. Well, I want to start getting now to um, very focused on equity and how do we achieve health equity outside of now just pure scientific and medical and health professional care, but now how do we create a community environment uh, that uh, Marcella Nunez Smith laid out for us in the very beginning of our conversation today. And I want to, uh, again, start there with Valerie and see if you can Leave, lead us into a little bit of an understanding of what do we mean and what are the elements of having a comprehensive community engagement uh, that leads us to health. And then I'll turn to our other two colleagues in a moment. So Reed, it first begins with listening to the community and knowing your community. We sit in the heart of West End of Atlanta, you get off 20 and here's Lee Street, we're in the heart of it. We have the largest, one of the largest groups of African-American undergraduate students and then medical students sitting in the heart of Atlanta. Now we could put fences around us, but it would not serve us well if we really are trying to educate and train leaders of tomorrow. We have to remove these fences and go out into this community and ask the community, how can we be of service? We see ourselves as anchoring institutions because we have resources that come from federal and state and tuition that allows us to have a system to stand up, to employ people and to educate. Now, what we do with those resources matters to the community. So if I look at COVID-19 as an example, we know the mistrust and distrust that has been built for years around the black and brown communities and the health system. So we started out with Blacks Against COVID-19, blackdoctors.org, the National Medical Association, National Urban League, the four historically black medical colleges, We've had, what, 10 town hall meetings, in, uh, Reed, and what we've done is we started out listening. We started out answering questions, thousands of questions from 30,000 people sometimes asking questions, and everybody talked about Tuskegee, everybody talked about the Mississippi appendectomies, everybody talked about something in their life, and guess what we were not? We were not dismissive. We did not dismiss people's fears and concerns. We tried to answer the question because we wanted them to continue to see first that we cared, we loved, and we needed their trust. We then moved to you all asking them, what would it take for you to be, even consider being on a vaccine trial? What would it take? So we made sure that we were on the NIH panels and the FDA panels, et cetera. And we started to look at the consent forms and look at the marketing material, et cetera, and say, this is not gonna resonate with my cousin over here in this zip code. We need to be better than that. So we used our influence to make sure that our community was heard. And then, and now we're continuing to advocate for resources to go to those grassroots organizations. Now, I love the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, but I need some dollars from the federal to go right here to the Federal Qualified Health Center right around the corner or to the grassroots organization right down the street that does nothing but ensures that people get enrolled 
in health in a health plan because those people know the community and they can be that messenger for us. And we've built a platform on our website, but everybody doesn't have a website, right? Everybody doesn't have access to the internet. So we're willing to take our mobile research van and drive to the Walmart parking lot or drive to Tennell, Georgia or drive to Buford, Georgia and set it up at the corner store if we need to in order to get people vaccinated. We've done vaccination Saturdays now for since the first week in January. And our challenge is you all, it's not the 8,000 people on the waiting list. It's the access and supply to the vaccine. So whereas vaccine hesitancy exists, it doesn't exist enough that we need to stop shooting people in the arm with the vaccine and making sure that it's available to them. So what I was trying to do, Reed, was to plant a connection for you. It first begins with listening and saying to the community that you care and then building solutions that are informed by the community and then leveraging your resources to remove the barriers for them to participate and a lot of times there is fear associated with participating, but we have to continue to reassure them that we are in the room and we need to invite them in that room with us so that they can know Beautiful. that we are authentic. As I turn to uh, Colleen, I just wanna indicate that um, uh, Valerie's point is so wonderful. Uh, if you go to the, and she mentioned the Black Coalition Against COVID, and we mentioned it a couple of times, we have a website called the Black, called Black Coalition Against COVID.org. And if you go there, you will see right on our homepage, a love letter to Black America from Black mm -hmm. uh, health professionals. And what it starts out with the number one thing, the first thing I was, is we love uh -huh. you. Does it sound familiar, folks? What did, what did, uh, uh, what was we the philosophy you. that we started with? I leave you love. <laughs> love builds. Mm -hmm. uh, right. So uh, let us be very clear that we start with not only listening, we start with love. Now, if we are going to, Colleen, be able to uh, meet the, uh, the, the comprehensive challenges, we have so many, as Valerie has touched on, uh, we've got the social determinants of disease. We've got people who are suffering from poor, inadequate housing, which really compromises our ability to fight the COVID fight and also sets us up for other conditions. We've got people living in food deserts in our community. We have communities that are unsafe with all the stress uh, that Tony knows about in terms of the psychological stress and what that does to our physiology. You are an entrepreneur who is dedicated to the community. What are your thoughts or guidance about how we, uh, those of us who are working at the level of community, how can we reach out and get the ear of the business owners, the corporate world, the small entrepreneurs of the world, and get them involved with us to provide or help support some of the community-based resources that we need to help us to, uh, to maintain and protect our health? So, uh... I, I agree with Valerie 100%. Um, MCI, in this COVID pandemic, MCI was called to Atlanta for a weekend of uh, support. And we stayed on the ground almost 90 days in Atlanta, single-handedly with a team. And we just came back from Atlanta. Uh, I've actually uh, um, uh, started a, uh, a laboratory there. One of the biggest things that I have seen um, is that uh, Valerie's right, we don't always have access to, we're in food deserts, uh, we're in IT deserts, um, and what we have tried to do, uh, MCI has spent millions of our own dollars supporting communities, and then to where I had to kind of say, I, 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 I'm, I'm for profit, but at the same time, my passion and my love, because I have never seen such a level of dispersity, disparity, uh, racism, as I have seen now, and I live in Oklahoma, and this has been probably one of the worst things that I could have ever imagined. I don't, what we're experiencing now is the best way to get that information out to everyone 
is that I have over 70, maybe now 150 ministers uh, that have endorsed us so that we can hold that vaccine because I have a thing that I say at our company. My mother looks like you. I look like you. My father looks like you. You can trust that when you show up, I'm not going into our bag and getting the brown needle, the white needle, the blue needle. We don't have time for that. I'm just going to give you the test that you need. We have been, um, so that is the, the, the biggest issue is that fear. But see, you can pop me out as the only African-American in the country that own a lab of this size and say, I look like you. I mean, you no harm. And I mean for you to save your life and the family and the loved ones that you have. So as Valerie was saying is that our vaccinees, and we get it, it's not enough to give us what we need. But see, Morehouse, I'm not afraid to go into the communities because see, we all lived in those communities. We got family that live in those communities. And those big laboratories, I can't do it all single-handed by myself. And I'm so happy to be on this team because I've been going around single-handed being, uh, sitting out groups and teams and supporting them and finding, okay, but the biggest support is groups like this, the people that's in the audiences. But my biggest support is, I believe that having the clergymen reach out to us, uh, people of influence, because see, the biggest, the biggest thing that black people are gonna do and people of color, we're gonna listen to that minister. I, you know, we hope that he don't take us down the wrong path, but at the end of the day, we are gonna listen to that minister. And I have reached out to so many and I have said, you gotta, you, gotta, you gotta help save us. I have one voice, but we need to bring all those voices together. And so where we are now from a laboratory perspective is that we've been saving us. Morehouse has been saving us. A lot of African-Americans have been saving us, but our voices are so scattered and they're not together. We don't really have that many laboratories like me that can pop me out and say, you're not getting a brown swab. You're not getting a white swab. You're just getting the swab. And when we start talking about saving your life with a vaccine, it's simple. How did we develop a vaccine so fast? I was at um, a location a couple of weeks ago, a whole row of black men uh, allowing the affluent to come in and get their shot. I pulled over and I said, what are we doing, guys? They said, well, we're, we're, we're doing the security and control. I said, have you guys gotten your vaccine? And they said, oh, no, we're not taking this. Oh, no, we're going to wait. What are you going to wait for? Until you kill grandma? What, what, what are we waiting for? Until you become asymptomatic? And I said, so listen, I said, I'm going to get out of my car right now. We're going to have a little conversation. And what I said to them, simple. You see all these people lining up in this line? They here in your neighborhood, before you get here, after you get here, and while you're sitting on the line being asymptomatic, you think that they got those people that got time to figure out if you got the brown vaccine or we giving you a chip? I said, listen to me. The government's not trying to find you unless you got a billion dollars and you rolling. But if you're just trying to pay your bills day to day, I hardly think the government's going to put a chip in you to, to figure out where you are. So let's do this. I said, you're going to come to my office and get tested. We're gonna see if you have any of those monoclonal antibodies. And if you do, I got a different conversation for you. But if you do not, if you do not, you don't stand on this sideline without your vaccine. So I believe that the churches have been our greatest fear. Now I'm doing a research program with a big church here in Dallas. It's a mega church. I, am, I employed them. I have about eight CLIAs. I have a mobile clinic a mobile clear that I can operate in all 50 states in the US. I have a very significant partner, Abbott. So our black churches aren't coming back, are they? So if you don't come back, you can't save my life because see, the, the, the members aren't tuning in to the, to the Zooms, they tired. COVID fatigue, they're tired, right? So one of the things that I did is I employed a church in uh, Dallas. It's a mega church and I don't mind to say the name. Uh, it's Pastor Ricky Rush, Ibach, in body, inspiring body of Christ. I did a lot of deployments at his church and I said, you gotta get this church back because you cannot help me save the lives if you don't. So I took his health ministry 
a couple doctors, nurses, and I gave them the technology to collect every Tuesday and Wednesday, they collect about 500 people in that community. They bring those tests to one of my offices. And on Sunday, all of those people get to come in their church. So we've, we're doing this and we've trained multiple uh, health ministries at churches. Because see, the only way that we get you back is you got to listen to somebody. And the church, the churches are one of our best avenues to have that com that come. Because see, beautifully, that, beautifully expressed. That, yeah. So we've done a lot in those spaces. So I wanna, we do need to. Wanna, in the interest of time, I want to emphasize something you said, Colleen, and I think it is real. I mean, I, I'm if, one of the things I'm taking away from this entire conversation. And I'm trying to, like, like Valerie had us close our eyes uh, earlier and do an imagination thing. By the way, uh, for all of you in the audience uh, who, who have children, uh, please give them time to close their eyes and dream. Uh, everything can't be negative. Everything can't be a problem. Every doggone thing that we do cannot be locked into some turmoil or controversy or upsetness. Just let our children have their childhood back, please. If y'all can do anything to help me on that, give our children their childhood back. Let them dream. So I'm going to dream for a minute and try to imagine you, Colleen. You're driving down the road in your car and you're seeing black security guards standing there protecting the right of white people to take our vaccine. And the black, black <laughs> I'm, wait, I mean, I'm just trying to get my head around that. Black security guards creating a safe environment for white people to come in and take our vaccine. And they themselves have not been vaccinated, but what did you do? You got out your car and walked over to them and said, I want to have a conversation with you. And I come back to Dr. Bethune's comment on her philosophy of equity. She said, I leave you love, love builds. It is positive and helpful. It's positive and helpful. I love it. I'm going to remember that forever. Uh, we have only a couple of minutes and I want to get some questions, but I want to go to Tony. And, if, and by the way, the team that's moderating y'all, if you've got some uh, questions for me. We only have a couple of minutes. We're going to go real, real fast and close on time. But I really want to see what, uh, what, what Tony has to say, particularly on this equity and comprehensiveness, especially as she looks at this from around the world. What are, what are your observations, Tony? Well, I want to um, speak to the points that have been made about the importance of community engagement and trusted um, messengers. That is important, not only in the United States, but it's around the world. Um, putting the community at the center of solutions is the way to engage those communities. Having trusted leaders um, are, is the way to engage the community. I was particularly um, struck by Valerie's comment about the importance of listening to the community. And I'll give you one example of how re here recently in the United States by listening to community leaders, um, it has helped to identify a solution that was um, uh, to a problem around how can we get more monoclonal antibodies uh, as a treatment for COVID as early as possible in the treatment, uh, in the progression of the disease. And it was a solution that came out of the community. You put the, you put the testing center next to the infusion center and ensure that there's a physician there who can write for the monoclonal antibodies. And so you don't progress to um, hospitalization. And that's, uh, Reed, as you well know, that's something that we're trying to get out into the community as soon as possible to empower individuals to advocate for themselves that if you have a positive um, COVID test, advocate for monoclonal antibodies and let's put the testing um, treatment infusion centers close together in the communities so that the, uh, the treatment that is available now and has been paid for by the federal government is readily available to um, communities of color. 
perfect. And Reed, can I add one it. thing? Reed, can I add one thing on this that I think I want everybody to take with this? And I hope that clinicians are thinking about this. When we are doing vaccinations on people, everybody has to wait 15 or 30 minutes. We have established a survey tool that we're asking people about their preventive health measures at that time. Have you had an annual wellness checkup? Have you had your mammogram? Have you had your colonoscopy, et cetera? We are using that time to educate our community. Great, thank you. Well, listen, as we wrap up, I wanna make sure though that as we closing out, but I wanna make sure that everybody understands what Tony's point is so important. Again, this whole panel has been about closing the gaps in outcomes of health for African-Americans. And what she's ended on is we have so many of our people who are being hospitalized. And again, we're bringing back the notion of what Dr. Uh, 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 Nunez Smith said. We're, we're being hospitalized at three times the rate of white America and dying twice as often. In that hospitalization, let us remember that there are tools that are at the disposal of the healthcare system to help you survive but we don't know about it. And we're not advocating for those tools. Monoclonal antibodies, big fancy word, don't get all upset about it. Um, you know, it's just, it, these are straightforward tools. And what we have to make sure we're doing is leaning on these hospital systems to ensure that we're getting access to the same treatment cocktails as Trump got when he got sick. And that's our right and responsibility. Ladies and gentlemen, this has been a wonderful panel. I know that you've got to be appreciative of these three women. You can't beat them. As we end, I want to end again with the words of Dr. Bethune. I leave you love. Love builds. It is positive. It's helpful. It's more beneficial than hate. Our aim must be to create a world of fellowship and justice where no man's skin, color, or religion is held against him or her. Love thy neighbor is a precept which could transform the world if it were universally practiced. Loving your neighbor means interracial, interreligious, and international. Ladies and gentlemen, let's love ourselves, carry forward, do what Janetta Cole teaches us to do, and that's to be intelligent, informed, thoughtful advocates for Black survival and Black life. Y'all take care.